WBUR Podcasts, Boston. I'm Daryl C. Murphy, and you're listening to The Common. So today, I'm here with WBUR news fellow Amy Moon. I heard this is like your last week or something like that. It is, it is. It's incredibly bittersweet, but I've loved it. I love BUR. Me too. And thank you so much yeah. for bringing us one of your last stories. Yeah, this is the last story, actually, yeah. What are we getting into today? Sure. So I don't know if you've ever been there. It's called Reggie Wong Park. It's a public park in Chinatown. Mm-hmm. And the community's basically fighting a multi-year battle to have some say in how it's protected and preserved. Now, first... Tell us a little bit about Reggie Wong Park. Take us there. Describe it for us. What kind of events happen there? Who's hanging out there? Sure. Paint paint a picture of Reggie Wong Park for us. I was actually just there yesterday talking to some community members, and it's kind of what you would imagine a normal urban park to look like. It fits, you know, a volleyball court, a couple of basketball courts. It's all paved. But it also has, you know, graffiti and cracks in the pavement Mm -hmm. and not a lot of tree coverage. It's covered with a black chain link fence. And sort of the biggest issues is that it sits right up against a parking lot for the Department of Transportation, which Mm. owns the land, a huge steam plant, and the I-93. And so there's been issues with air pollution and just heat and just struggles for the community that want to use that space for volleyball, basketball, and also community cultural events. Yeah, the space around the park, like, it doesn't sound super welcoming. It feels like it's just dropped in with all this kind of industrial setting, you know? Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, this lot is kind of left over from when there was a lot of construction with the Big Dig, and it's kind of the only space. It's the only recreational space in Chinatown, but it's a very modest-looking park, I have to say. Okay. Now, before we continue with the park itself— Tell us about the person the park is named after, Reggie Wong. Yeah, so um, Reggie, Reginald Wong, he was a really beloved figure in Chinatown. He was a business leader, but he also advocated for small businesses in the community. He was like go-between for a lot of the community members where English wasn't their first language. And he also really loved sports. Like he was a huge supporter of volleyball, specifically nine-man volleyball, which is a very specific Asian-American brand of volleyball brought over by Chinese immigrants to Boston. Mm. He was just someone that really advocated for the health and prosperity of the community. And so Reggie Wong, um, he died a little over a decade ago, and they named this park after him through thousands of people coming together to petition to have this spot in the community in his honor. So this person is clearly somebody who is revered by the community. Absolutely. But now they have this park named after him. That's not really living up to his name. And they want to make some changes, I understand. What's going on there? Yeah, I think that's what a lot of people in the community would say. They love it. They've been using it for 50 years, and it's a core part of sort of the cultural hub that is Boston's Chinatown. But at the same time, it's badly in need of improvements, and the community's been wanting to get a formal lease. My main kind of point of contact has been Russell Eng, who's actually the nephew of Reggie Wong, and has started a nonprofit to help fight for this park and its preservation. But it's been a struggle communicating with the Department of Transportation, which owns the land. And not long ago, not only did they have challenges getting to a legal agreement, they found out there was a problem with the soil. Mm. So this is Russell talking about it here. So then we kept pushing and we haven't really heard a lot from them. We'd email them. We got, you know, pretty much the silent treatment. And then they came back and says, oh, here's the new lease. We found that there's, I guess, asbestos particles in the in the landscape. And we think it's underneath the hard surface. It was a huge disappointment for the community. Like in 2019, three years ago, they had gotten a verbal agreement from then Secretary of Transportation Stephanie Pollack saying that, you know, here's a draft lease, you know, almost ready to sign, totally, you know, in their view, understanding all the changes that they want to make. And then silence, and boom, they get these news that there's asbestos in the soil, and there hasn't really been an agreement between the two parties of who's responsible for cleaning it up. Mm. So there's asbestos under the park, renovations need to be made, while they're trying to get a lease. So that would mean that it's MassDOT's responsibility to address the asbestos, right? 
Yeah, so I reached out to MassDOT. I wasn't able to get anyone to actually speak with me. Mm-hmm. They, they sent me a comment that says they are willing to remediate the park. The catch is that it's the degree to which they're willing to do that. They're willing to clean up what's there and keep the status quo as is. That means cracked pavements, you know, not great condition of the park as it is right now, and they're willing to lease that to the community. But from the community's perspective, they're like, wait a minute, it's been years. We've been sharing with you that we want to actually make this park a place that flourishes for the community. We want to make these improvements, but they can't do that without triggering potentially more asbestos, more contamination. I mean, we're talking about asbestos here. Why wouldn't they just fix it? So like I said, I haven't been able to speak with anyone from MassDOT directly, but I did consult some experts in the conservation space and in the real estate space. And sort of the first thing that they say is that if you're a government agency and your primary function is something other than parks, like transportation, your number one priority is going to be to reduce the liability, right? You actually don't want people being potentially exposed to environmental hazards and then having lots of issues later. So that's one thing to consider is that from the state's perspective, if it weren't for this community kind of outcry, they probably want to minimize the risk as much as possible. The second thing to consider is that they may want to handle the asbestos and deal with the soil contamination, but do it in a different way. You know, like I said, this space is prime real estate. And from some perspectives, the state has a responsibility to steward this land that they have and potentially make the most revenue they can out of it so that they can use that revenue for other infrastructure projects, right? To just give you a little sense of scale about that, it's like the parcel across the street, they just accepted a bid from developers who would you know, not only handle cleanup, but also develop affordable housing, also make other features on that land, the bid was for $61 million, right? And so when you think about the competing interests that a state has when they're thinking about this kind of land, they're taking into lots of different factors and not just what a community might want for cultural and historical reasons. We're going to take a quick break, but we'll be right back with more on Reggie Wong Park. Did you kill Marlene Johnson? I think you're one of the first people to have actually asked. From WBUR and ZSP Media, this is Beyond All Repair, a new podcast about an unsolved murder that will leave you questioning everything. Somebody should be in jail for murdering my sister. A woman who's never been believed. As long as they think I have done this, then they're not looking for who actually did this. And that's what makes it a cold case. No, it's a botched case. And a search for the truth, once and for all. Wow, it just gets more interesting. Beyond All Repair. Listen and follow wherever you get your podcasts. Be careful. You're digging in a place that's been very peaceful for a while. Do it anyway. Dig. And we're back. Now, does the city have a role or a say in any of this? So I think that's kind of an open question at this point. Among the real estate and conservation experts that I spoke to, you know, it would be sort of a natural place for the city to step in. But the community members told me that apart from their local city councilor, Ed Flynn, who's been a strong supporter, the city itself hasn't been involved in discussions for, you know, a year and a half. And so we're not really sure what's going on there. I reached out to um, Reverend Mariama White-Hammond's office. She's Mayor Wu's chief of environment, energy, and open space. And, you know, wasn't able to sit down with her. But she sent me a comment basically saying that, you know, she supports the community's advocacy, especially given how they've not been able to have access to open space in the past. So I would say that probably generally the city is supportive from what I understand from the comment, but they haven't been actively involved. We're not really sure why. Hmm. Is there any way the community could buy that land? Yeah, so some experts that I spoke to said that it's not unusual for the state to hand over this type of land to a city, such as the city of Boston, that has parks and recreation and open space departments that know how to deal with this type of land. The other options would be for the community to seek permanent protections for the land as a public park. There are actually parts of the Massachusetts Constitution that arguably would protect this type of open space for the community. But I think that would be a legal battle that would be you know, pretty difficult to undertake as a small nonprofit in the community. Mm. So what can be done? What's happening now? 
So right now, the community, the Friends of Reggie Wong Park and a coalition of local organizations, they're still negotiating with the state. And they're actually going to meet with them next week to further discussions. But it's a challenging situation because, you know, they still haven't come to an agreement about what's going to be the condition of the park if and when they get it. And that will largely determine whether or not they can make the kinds of improvements that they want to make. So it's, it's been a pretty frustrating situation for the community. Yesterday, I had a chance to talk to Catherine Friedman, who's one of the board members of the nonprofit. She's also an architect, and she sort of described the situation um, where their hands are tied. You know, the frustration of knowing that there's likely asbestos on here, knowing that it's unsafe, and just not being able to address it, not being able to do anything about making improvements. And the other aspect of this is that Reggie Wong Park is as you described it, this big, hard surface, you know, asphalt, which gets very hot in the summer. And Chinatown is a big part of a heat island in that part of the city, right? Yeah, that's absolutely right. Um, Is any of that being taken into consideration for this? Well, I mean, it's one of the challenges that the communities brought up. Not only does it have the heat island effect from having very little tree coverage or parkland, Reggie Wong Park specifically has been the site of studies by local universities looking at the air pollution because it's sitting right next to the highway, and it's one of the worst in Boston. So for many different reasons, environmentally, this is really a a challenging um, area for the community. Where does this lie in the historical context for Chinatown? Is this typical for that community, you know, this type of conflict? Yeah, I mean, most of the folks that I talk to in the community, this is about Reggie Wong Park, but it's also about so much more than that. You know, you're looking at a community that, like I've mentioned, has problems with extreme heat, air pollution, you know, soil contamination now, right? Um, But at the same time, if you go all the way back to when Chinese immigrants were really um, populous in the area in the 1880s, they were living in land that was a landfill. That's mm-hmm. what Boston Chinatown sits on, right? It was land that was cheap enough for them to live in and also the only place they could really gather because they were excluded from other places. But now, zoom forward many years, it's prime real estate, right, that people want to be able to build on, that they want to develop things. Um, some rightfully so, right, you need critical infrastructure for the city. And so in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, when the state is undergoing huge infrastructure projects like building the central artery or extending the mass turnpike, they also displaced thousands of families living in Chinatown and also other immigrant communities in order to do that, Mm. right? And so every time that I talk to someone in the community, it's about Reggie Wong Park, but it's also about the history, right? It's also about this continued pattern as they see it of just not consulting the community and kind of deprioritizing them um, over other state interests. One person I spoke to who felt really passionate about this was someone named Norman Eng. Um, and he is the director of a local volleyball team that, that plays in Reggie Wong Park. And he actually told me that he felt like getting access to Reggie Wong Park and making it a great place for the community to enjoy was reparations for everything that had happened. Today is all about spatial justice. Those of you that know about the history of Chinatown and know about the highway and everything that we've gone through in our community know that this piece of land is ours. This is our park. So that was Norman Ang speaking at an event that the community had at the end of October to really rally support for the signing of this lease. And just wanted to make a note that Norman and Russell Ang are not related. Man, this is so much bigger than just a park. You know, if I'm someone who's here in this episode and I want to show support for the community uh, in Chinatown, what can I do? Well, I would say that if you live in Boston, if you live um, especially near Chinatown or the Leather District, there are lots of opportunities to get involved with the community, right? To not just see Chinatown as a place where you go and you get something, you get some food or you get some culture and you leave, but a place where you really invest. There are places in Boston where, you know, public open space is thriving, you know, where there's lots of wonderful developments and opportunities that the community can enjoy. And You can see that in Chinatown, you know, it's a fraction of that, right? Mm -hmm. They have no open space such that they're fighting over Reggie Wong Park, which is in and of itself a park that could be greatly improved. Mm. What's next for the community? So right now, I mean, they're still going to be at the bargaining table with the Department of Transportation. But I think everyone is very conscious of the fact that 
you know, there's a new administration coming in. So after all of these years of negotiating, of empty promises from the community standpoint, they might have yet another contact to deal with come January. Understood. Amy, thank you so much for this story. This is uh, just reminds me that, yeah, there's a lot of history here and a lot of hurt here. And sure. sometimes it like these these small things about something like a park or whatever like it brings all of that up you know so it's um this is a very interesting story thank you so much for bringing it to us thank you daryl that's wbur news fellow amy moon and that's our show for today thank you so so much for listening to the common Hit us up on Instagram or Twitter at WBUR The Common or shoot us an email at thecommon at WBUR.org. We would absolutely love to hear from you. I'm Daryl C. Murphy, and I'll talk to you tomorrow.